And you can teach a chicken to climb a tree, but you're better off getting a squirrel in the first place. Welcome to episode 90 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Pargava. The voice you just heard is my guest for today's episode, Gary Swart. Gary is best known as the former CEO of Odesk, now known as Upwork, and over the last 30 years, Gary has held senior roles at organizations such as IBM and Intellibank. He now spends his time on the other side of the table as a general partner at Polaris Partners, a $4.5 billion fund that invests in healthcare and technology. We covered a range of topics in this interview, including how to hire for scale, what he looks for as an investor, and Gary's career mistakes and lessons learned. But a key theme of this interview was on focusing on your strengths. For those of you who've been following the podcast over the last two and a half years, you may have noticed that I took some time off recently from publishing episodes, and a large part of this reason was to focus on my own business. But I am delighted to be back, and I'm looking forward to continuing to bring you interviews with the best founders and investors each week. You may have also noticed a new sound and structure to this podcast. This episode was produced by the awesome team at Playbook Media. If you would like to launch your own personal or business podcast, you can reach out to me at rohit at playbookmedia.com.au. Without further ado, here is my interview with Gary Swart. Hi, Gary. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time this morning to be on the show. Good morning. Very happy to be here. Uh, so, Gary, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Sure. Um, so I've been an operator for, I can't believe, three decades. It's a long time. And uh, uh, all of in, that in Silicon Valley. I started a little company called Pure Software. And Pure was uh, Reed Hastings' first company. Reed, now the CEO of Netflix. Uh, he was a geek in a prior life. And we had uh, tools uh, to make software developers better software developers. A uh, successful company went public in the mid '90s. A series of mergers and acquisitions, and ultimately acquired by a company called Rational Software. And then Rational was acquired by IBM a couple years after that. So I went from tiny little startup to employee number 131,000 at, at IBM over, uh, I guess that was almost 10 years. Uh, I left IBM to join a little. Um, uh, a startup called IntelliBank, and that was a character building experience. Essentially, that was Dropbox done wrong uh, about a dozen years ago. And then I left there to uh, join a company called Odesk. And Odesk uh, had uh, a very small team and some founders, and I came in to uh, essentially run that company. I was the CEO for about nine years. We merged with the number two competitor in the space, a company called Elance, created a new company called Upwork, the world's largest online workplace. And then I decided to jump to the other side of the table and become an investor with Polaris Partners, a venture capital firm uh, located in Boston and San Francisco. Uh, we manage about four and a half billion dollars and invest in both healthcare and technology companies. So that's what three decades looks like. <laughs> Fantastic. Obviously, there's so many aspects of your career that I want to sort of dive into, but you mentioned that IntelliBank was, was a character building experience uh, and essentially that it was meant to be kind of box, but but the um, potentially the execution of that wasn't quite right. What, what was it from that particular experience that you took away that you sort of applied to Odesk and, and your other sort of ventures since then? Well, a good friend of mine says experience is what you get when you don't get all the other things you want. And we got a lot of experience at IntelliBank. And I wouldn't have been able to go from IBM directly to Odesk. I needed that those lessons learned from what we uh, failed to get right at IntelliBank to prepare me to, for, for the Odesk job. And so uh, not to mention the fact that I don't think they would have hired me for that job had I not had this experience. So some of the valuable lessons learned, we had, uh, honestly, we had 60 customers of 50 different flavors, right? So we did not really have product market fit. We were so consultative that we'd walk into a client and say, you know, how can we help? And they'd say, well, this is the problem we'd have. And we said, well, we could do that. And then we would build the product for that. So we, we looked more like a services business and at the time, we were competing with the likes of SharePoint uh, for Microsoft. So here, here we are, you know, trying to, uh, you know, be all things to all people. I often say dessert topping and floor wax, and people <laughs> want to buy both. And so it was, uh, it was a lack of fo- focus uh, on the product side. It was um, a failed go-to-market. We, we were selling enterprise, 
uh, and clearly, you know, Dropbox out executed on a on a viral um, prosumer model, right? And we had way too much functionality for where we were. So this giant horizontal product trying to please everybody, and just so so many valuable lessons about what we got wrong. But it was those valuable lessons that forced focus on my next company. You know, often there's there's so much talk about you know ensuring that your customers are really happy so that they stick around, you know, it's so much easier to to keep a customer happy and, and deliver that lifetime value than it is to, to get a new customer on. But obviously balancing that, as you mentioned, with having that focus of what is it that, what is the actual problem that we're trying to solve is often a really tough balancing act to, to get right as well. Do you have any advice for, for founders that are potentially going through that phase where they have all of these different opportunities or potential sort of users or, or clients that are asking them for additional features or, or additional kind of areas, how they can find the right uh, the right way to focus on, on the right things? Well, um, we talked about this yesterday at the Above All Human Conference. It, um, it, you've got to have a narrow enough focus such that you can own that hill, right? So you want to own a hill. It doesn't really matter what hill it is as long as you can own it. Now, preferably, it'll be a big hill, right? You don't want it to be so small that it's insignificant. And you want to be able to have a story that says, if I own this hill, I can get this hill next, right? So let's think about some successful businesses like OpenTable, for example. They didn't have to own all of the markets. They had to own New York and Chicago and San Francisco. And that was enough to build a nice business. And then they could move into other markets. Uber, they didn't start by owning the world. They started in a couple of cities, Airbnb, New York and Paris. Why? Well, that's where... Um, uh, hotels are expensive, lots of travelers. Uh, a lot of people have expensive apartments, but go away for the weekends. And it, it just was a natural fit, supply and demand, easy to capture and the like. So you think about uh, how, uh, and obviously you expand from there. So how do you own a hill? And so in picking that hill, I don't know, I, I don't know what advice to give somebody to pick the right hill other than you have to pick one, right? It's not um, what is the saying that startups, more startups die of indigestion, not from starvation. And so pick a hill, give yourself a time frame to say, how will we know that we've been successful at this, uh, you know, focused on this particular thing and then move to adjacencies or uh, pick a different hill, right? But you can't hedge. At some point, you have to pick a major before you graduate college. You can't go the whole you know, five years saying, well, I'll declare next year, I'll declare next year. You have to pick a major. Yeah. On that, uh, I think one of the other things that we spoke about briefly during the speaker interviews at Above All Human yesterday was the importance of self-awareness. One of the things that, that really struck out to me about your talk yesterday was um, really honing in and focusing on your strengths. And again, that can be really, really difficult for people to understand and find, especially if they're very new and early in their journey. So for example, I, I meet with a lot of founders who naturally think that growth or marketing is their strong suit because they're not really tech, they're not really design, but they don't really have an, a background in marketing or haven't really marketed a business previously. Any advice that you've got for, for founders in terms of how they can understand what their strengths are and what some of the weaknesses are that they need to fulfill by hiring the right, right people around them? Yeah, this is a, a difficult lesson to learn. And I think it just, for, for me, you know, I look back at my career and it, it's one that comes with wisdom. It comes from years and years of operating. And in the early days, your tendency is to want to do it all yourself. Uh, the problem with that is that there's just no leverage in that scenario. You just don't grow. If you have to be in the room and responsible and, you know, the person that makes all the decisions and implements everything, it, it's going to be really, really hard to scale your business. And so for me, the eye-opening moment was when, you know, you hire an executive that knows far more about the subject matter than you do. Uh, they're phenomenal at hiring and leading people. And you as the founder or the CEO can go focus on something else that A, you like and B, that you're really good at. Um, I had a boss once who said, the worse you sleep, the better I sleep. And I got offended by that. I was like, yeah, I'm working hard and you're sleeping at night. And he's like, yeah, that's why I have you. <laughs> like you. And so that is the, it's, it's about leverage and best and highest use. So this self-awareness of what you're good at and where you excel and what you're not good at. And the more you can get somebody else worrying about that, the better you're going to sleep at night. And I think some of the best leaders have uh, set up uh, scenarios where that's the case, right? So again, from a, from a founder perspective, they're often in the best position, especially early on, to, to sell their product. 
when is the right time that they should start thinking about bringing the right people in to start scaling and developing processes around their, their operations? By the way, I think that's a really important point. In the early days, I really like it when I meet now as an investor, when I meet companies where, you know, they'll say, well, we have one or $2 million of ARR. And I'll say, great, how many salespeople? They say, well, none. I've handled sales up until now, but I think we're ready. And I really like that because, you know, typically these people aren't salespeople. They're product founders or engineers or um, whatever, but they've connected with their customers. They understand the problem. They, you know, if they can't sell it, nobody can. Um, on the flip side, I've seen a lot of companies that have uh, said, well, we haven't sold anything, but I'm not really a salesperson. And so we hired this sales leader, but they haven't sold anything yet either. And there's flags all over the field, right? red flags on the field. So I think in the early stages, the founder is the best person to really connect with customers and understand and go out and, and really you know establish that product market fit. Uh, but your question is, when's the right time? So the right time is when you've put a little bit of kindling on the fire and the logs have started catching and you have evidence that there's product market fit. I think that's a good time to bring somebody in that can now help get it to the next level. But it's imperative that the founder and CEO um, get somebody in that they know beyond the shadow of a doubt can sell. Because otherwise, it takes 30, 30 days. It takes 90 days to find somebody. It takes another 90 days to ramp them or get them up to speed. Another 90 days for them to figure out where the customers are. And you've just lost nine months. And if you've gone nine months with the wrong person before you've sold anything, it's not necessarily the money or the cash that you're burning by paying that person. It's the time that you've wasted going down the wrong path. So uh, in medical school, they have this concept, watch one, do one, teach one. You watch a surgery, you do a surgery, and then you teach a surgery. And I view that as the role of the CEO. You uh, hire somebody, you as the CEO show them, this is how I've been selling it up until now. Then they do one and then they teach the sales team and you're off to the races. I found the best hiring processes that I've had is when I've tried to do the job myself to some degree. So I have a better understanding of what to look for in the potential hire as well. Otherwise, it's really, really difficult to understand, for example, if you haven't played around with a particular aspect of marketing or growth or whatever it may be, to understand specifically what it is that you're looking for if you haven't had some form of experience in terms of what's required to, to fulfill that role. I absolutely agree. You have empathy for the, the job and you know what the challenges are. And as you said, you hone in on what you need. I'll give you a quick example of that. So at one point we were hiring a product leader at Odesk and we had um, an incredible product leader with really great skills and great strengths. Uh, but uh, we were moving from the dirt road onto the highway and this person had never operated on the highway. So we needed someone who would operate on the highway. And before we went out to hire, I had a conversation with our chairman and we were discussing what we thought we needed in a product leader. And we really designed the job around where we were falling short, right? So if you think about product, I, you know, I break it into four buckets. There's the what, the why, and the how. What do we build? Why do we build that? How do we build that? There's the project management aspect of product, keeping the trains on the tracks. There's the usability or the UX and the UI and having a, a beautifully designed product. And then there's um, sort of the uh, communication and collaboration with, with engineering right? Somebody who preferably has been an engineer, so they know bits and bytes and they can figure out, uh, they know how long or how to, to build something. And so those are four pretty distinct buckets. And what are the chances that you find somebody that has all four of those areas covered? Well, pretty slim. So we figured out what we needed the most of, and that really defined our search for that product leader right? And in the process of interviewing, you know, you really could say, hey, well, you define for me what you think the areas of product and where do you think you're strong? And give me examples of this rather than saying, hey, can you do this, right? And so by understanding what you need and by defining it, it really can hone uh, your search to make sure you're bringing the right skills, knowledge, personal characteristics, and motivation to the table. Another point that really stuck out to me from your talk yesterday was the importance of having that right team around you. What does the right team look like for you? Well, we, we just touched on this a little bit. You know, there's the jungle, there's the dirt road, and there's the highway. And you need different skills at different times. And so the right team uh, in the early stages of a company may look very different than the right team uh, 
as the, the company grows. But what has to be consistent throughout um, the company's uh, life cycle, uh, there, there's a couple of things that stand out for me. Most people hire based on skills and knowledge. They say, well, I need a CFO. I'm not going to hire a CFO who isn't a CB, CPA. But those are table stakes. You need those just to get to the table in the first place. So there might be a certain set of skills and knowledge that somebody has to have in order to get into your company. And the knowledge, I mean domain expertise. You're running a marketplace business, they were at eBay. You're running a financial services, they were at Visa. You know, it's like they've got domain expertise. And most people focus and emphasize on those two things. And what they fail to emphasize and focus on is the personal characteristics. What are the adjectives that you would use to describe this hire? And what are the adjectives that you want in your company? And the reason why personal characteristics are so important is because those are the things that you cannot change about somebody. You can't teach smart. You can't teach hardworking. You can't teach high integrity. Um, so you're better off hiring for those things in the first place. And I mentioned this yesterday. You know, a good um, a friend said, you can teach a chicken to climb a tree, but you're better off getting a squirrel in the first place. And until you figure out what a squirrel looks like, I, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to train chickens to climb. And so, you, again, this, this comes with wisdom. So really important that you define the personal characteristics. And next is the motivation, right? What is it that this person that you're hiring wants out of a career, wants out of this job, wants out of life? And if they're looking for something that you can't offer, don't waste your time because you're going to get somebody in that's not going to be happy and you're going to replace them in 18 months. And again, you're going to spend that 90 days to hire, 90 days to ramp, 90 days to get them up to speed. And you just don't have the time. So I think it's really important to focus on the personal characteristics and the motivation and not to ignore yellow lights. Don't proceed. Do not pass go. Don't collect $200 if you're not um, aligned on those things uh, above the skills and the knowledge. Testing for personal characteristics during the interview can be exceptionally hard to to gauge. Do you have any any tips or, or advice in terms of how you go about that process? Well, first first things first, you have to define them. So now you've got your list. And if I were interviewing you, I might ask, um, what adjectives would your previous boss use to describe you? And the reason I like that is because it gets people out of the frame of mind of thinking, hmm, what would I say about myself? They'd say, what would my previous boss say? And the reason why I think that's a decent question is because you could always call that previous boss. Right? You could always ask them. Uh, another tactic that I like is, um, is the back channel reference. Like if I see a decent resume, and a lot of people don't like this, but what I might do is I might go to LinkedIn, see who I know who knows this person and say, hey, um, off the record, haven't even spoken to Rohit yet. Like I, we haven't even talked, but I just want to know, would you use any of these words to describe him? Where is he on the scale of one to 10 on this continuum? And uh, because I don't want to waste his time or my time, it's not a fit. And that can be a really good way because you're not asking for a reference. You're saying, hey, is this person an A player? And if people come back and say, yes, this is an A player, then I run, don't walk to, to meet those folks. So... Um, Another question I like is, you know, what what would your previous boss uh, say you need to improve? Right? What are the things that they told you you needed to work on? And for the people that roll their eyes and say, hmm, let me see. I like the quick answer where somebody says, they told me I needed to work on this. This is the one thing that they said I could improve on. Because what is that? Well, that's honesty. That's smart. That's self-awareness. That's high integrity. It's candor. Like we're just meeting each other and you're happy to tell me what your boss said you need to work on. So that shows open and honest communication, right? One of the other things, I feel like there's so many different components of your talk that I loved yesterday. One of the things that really resonated with me is you mentioning people or founders in general, not looking for the biggest payoff in the short term, but really thinking about longer term, what is it that they want to achieve? And I think the the specific example that you gave was not trying to chase something that would give you the most uh, most annual income, for example, in, in the first year. Can you sort of elaborate a little bit more on, the, on that point in terms of what that, what that means and how you sort of approach that generally in, in terms of your career? Yeah, when I look back and, I, you know, I've made some pretty significant um, uh, career mistakes. Like, uh, you know, I stayed at a company for the short-term 
a compensation as opposed to you know rolling the dice. And that was uh, an offer to become employee number three at a little company. They were sending DVDs via via the mail called Netflix. And so I, um, when I look back, you know my my criteria uh, now I have a framework for looking at it. And if I had applied this framework. 20 years ago, I would have made a different decision. And so first and foremost, um, do you like doing it and are you good at it, right? So if you love sports, well, why not go work for StubHub or a sporting company or something? You know what I mean? Like pick something that you can really get excited about and preferably one that you're good at, right? So if you're not good at marketing, don't f try and force a size 10 foot into a size eight shoe, right? Like, um, so, and then the second thing is uh, to, to work with great people, right? So along the lines of personal characteristics that we were just talking about, if you have those personal characteristics and so do others, well then go there, right? I mean, you have an opportunity to work with great people and that's, uh, that's harder than it, uh, than it seems or sounds to do. So those are sort of like table stakes. And then underneath that, I think there's four things. There's impact, there's growth and development, there's financial reward, and there's balance. And those are the sort of main criteria above and beyond work with great people and do you like it. And I think it's only each individual has to stack rank those criteria in their priority order. There may be times in people's lives where financial reward is at the top of the list. They have to make money. They have to repay student loans. They have a mortgage. They have kids, whatever it is. So I think you have to stack rank those criteria. But what turned out to be uh, more important for me was um, impact and growth and development. And I made a decision for financial reward. And a couple of years later, I realized that I wasn't, I was in a situation, this was at IBM where I was employee number 131,000. I couldn't make an impact. The company was just too big. And it didn't matter if I came to work or not. It wasn't fulfilling. And the company was doing great things, but I didn't believe we were making a massive impact on the world. It wasn't meaningful enough for me. And then the other thing was growth and, uh, and development right? My growth curve had flattened. I started looking at jobs that I could have in five years and I didn't want those jobs today. So, and it would have been fine. I could have stayed at the company and, uh, you know, maybe wake up uh, today and be driving a BMW, maybe have a beach house, but it wasn't enough. And so I either had to change my aspirations or change my environment. I had to say, listen, I'm going to be comfortable with this and I'm not going to regret not stepping up to the plate or, I'm going to have to step up to the plate. And the other thing I realized is that I could always go back to a big company. So for me, once I stepped out, uh, about six months later, I was regretting part of that compensation, you know, and the, the travel perks and staying in nice hotels and never renting less than a Volvo from Hertz and great benefits and the like. But it was, um, I, I, I look back now and I'm, I, I say, I wish I had stepped out even sooner, right? I, I was, um, I, I just wasn't ready to resign myself to that big company. Yeah. I, I knew something we were talking about just before we turned on the microphones was almost shifting that mindset of, of people. I get this a lot in Australia as well. When I first quit my engineering job to pursue a, a fashion tech startup, which my parents were not so enthused about, but I, I guess one of the, the big things that I had with a lot of friends who aren't from the tech startup space were telling me was oh my God, I can't believe that you're giving up these opportunities and this this job to go pursue something with a whole heap of risk. What if it doesn't work out? And my thinking of going about this was I could always come back. I could always get another job. But the upside of if this did work, I got to do something that I love doing and I could do this forever. And if it didn't work, I could come back and do the similar job. There was no risk versus looking at it as an opportunity of, oh my God, I don't have, you know, we don't have the nice hotels and, and all of those things sort of coming in as well. So I, I, I massively agree with, kind of thinking about what is the worst case scenario. I think founders in, in general as well are risk takers by nature, but I think they're almost prepared for what happens if if there is a worst case scenario and what does that worst case scenario look like? And it's often not as bad as, as most people make it out to seem. Yeah, I agree. I was speaking with an entrepreneur yesterday and um, he had a really interesting scenario. He said he had a great job. Uh, he liked the people he worked with. He said he was learning a ton. He was in a position where he could make an impact. Um, but he wasn't super excited about the work. And I, we talked about my framework, impact, growth and development, finance, reward and balance. And I said, you should list those out and categorize 
and see where do you stack? And he said, well, right off the bat, I know I don't have three of them. I don't have three of those things. So he only had one. It was the financial reward. And like you could see his face. He was like, gee, why am I staying with what I'm doing? I said, hey, let me ask you a personal question. So are you married? Yes. Do you have kids? No. And uh, what's the downside? Like, you know, what if you pursued it for a year? What if you gave yourself a year? Or what if you even delayed? What if you said, hey, I'm going to wait until I can get a couple of customers and then I'll leave my job? Oh, by the way, he was doing both at the same time. And he had raised some money for his, his startup. And so, you know, for somebody like that, it's like, oh, you should just go. Like you're young, like now's the time. You don't have kids, you don't have a mortgage. You can afford, your wife has a job, you can afford to go get this experience. And if you do leave your company and come back in a year, you'll be more experienced, right? You, and you'll go back saying, hey, I stepped up to the plate. You won't regret it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, um, here I am sitting before you saying, I regret not going to the startup years ago. And even though when I finally did leave IBM and I went to the company in Telebank, we were not successful. That was not a successful outcome. I do not regret it. Not one bit because I wouldn't have been eligible for the next job. I needed that experience and I wasn't going to get it at the big company. We were too much on the highway. I hadn't rolled up my sleeves and stepped up to the plate and swung the bat, right? Absolutely. So speaking of, of using that kind of operating experience and, and the experience that you've had over the last 30 years, you're now on the other side of the table at Polaris Ventures. Do you want to talk a little bit about what Polaris Ventures does? Sure. So we're, uh, we've been around for about 20 years. We're located in the States, in um, uh, primarily in Boston and San Francisco. Uh, we manage $4.5 billion. We're investing at a fund eight, which is $450 million bucks, And we invest in both healthcare and technology. So on the healthcare side, it's everything from... Uh, gene editing, uh, CRISPR technology, Cas9, uh, uh, Polaris uh, invests in a company that has the patent on that technology called Editas Medicine. And then on the uh, tech side, it's companies like uh, WordPress and Inside Sales and uh, Bidium and Recurly and Quantcast and, you know, typically B2B SaaS companies. Really curious to know, based on the previous experience that you've had, how does that shape what you look for in, in companies that you decide to invest in? Well, I think, um, you know, being a good operator and having a career as, as an operator doesn't necessarily make you a great investor, right? Um, but what I like about it is, you know, I'm looking for founders who are passionate about what they're doing. I'm looking for people that have ideas that I call uh, aspirins, not vitamins, right? So these are real painkillers. Significant pain exists and they have a unique way of solving that pain. They're going to be able to stand out when you walk into the pharmacy and see all the different painkillers you could, you could choose as theirs going to be uh, differentiated enough. And then I want to see that a lot of people have that headache, right? That it's a, that it's a big uh, pain. And I, I look for um, co companies and people that have some, they have product market fit. So they've established that, hey, we're solving something and customers actually want it and they're willing to pay for it. And in most cases, it's more of a challenge scaling. So, you know, sometimes good product engineering founders have a great idea, but they failed to, to capture the go to market, right? That IntelliBank lesson. We had a phenomenal product. We really did. It was elegantly designed. It was fully functional. The functionality we had a dozen years ago uh, was it was more than uh, companies like Box have today. I mean, we really had designed a full featured product. Our flaw was in the go to market. It was the hill we picked, and it was the failure to execute on that hill. And um, so I look for people that have sort of uh, figured out those mistakes. And I, I like companies with what I call upside. Uh, you know, I invested in one company, and the founder was in front of me, and he said, Well, we, we don't have a lot of customers. We have 20 customers, but um, every customer you've sold to has come back and bought more. And when you dig in a little bit, you realize that they had 20 customers with no sales skill on their team. Now you're looking at a recovering sales leader. And I look at something like that and say, oh my gosh, I could sell the heck out of this. And that company was bought by Cisco for about $300 million 11 months later. So we're on about $6 million of revenue. So I like these uh, 
assets where maybe they haven't captured the go-to-market and I can add significant value there. So I look for areas where we as a firm, as an investment firm, can add value as well. On that, you know, often there's there's a lot of talk from entrepreneurs about, um, you know, how do I position myself so that I'm the most appealing to, to a particular investor? But what is it that, that founders should look for when they're doing their own due diligence on, on the investors or VCs that they, they decide to take money from? Um, first, you didn't ask me this question, but to, to make yourself look attractive, I think it's, uh, it's good PowerPoint. So, you know, you have a good story. You're telling a, a amusing PowerPoint as the metaphor for a great um, vision. And it helps if you have some Excel to back up the PowerPoint. So it's probably mostly PowerPoint in the very early days, but a little bit of Excel doesn't hurt. And then as you go through the A or the B round, obviously there's going to be more Excel than there is PowerPoint. Um, and we always look for sort of an act two and an act three. We say, okay, act one is, you know, Odesk in the early days, we were, we were helping uh, small businesses find offshore engineering talent. But the vision was that we were going to be the Amazon for work find the right worker, manage that worker, pay that worker as if they were in your same office globally for all work types, right? The eBay or the Amazon for, for uh, online work. Um, what, what entrepreneurs should look for in investors, it's not dissimilar from what we talked about from an employee standpoint. They should look for personal characteristics, motivation, skill, and knowledge. And the reason why the personal characteristics and motivation, again, are top because you're going to be working together for 10 years, maybe longer. And do you really want to be sitting across the table from this person that may not have high integrity? They may not be as hardworking as you. They may not be as smart. You may, if you say, look, I don't care about any of those things. I just want their brand name on my, on my deal. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll go for um, what they perceive to be a shiny object and they realize very quickly that that person may be a good investor, but they're not a value-added resource to help them to uh, to to grow and and uh, to grow their business. One of the things that really stuck out to me from your talk yesterday was you mentioning that you have obviously come from from a sales background, but when you were building out Odesk, you didn't actually need a sales team to be there because the product, if I understand correctly, was kind of selling itself. Not true. Let me let me clarify. But did, did we we realized we didn't need a sales team, but it was different motivation. So what happened was, um, we we had a sales team. We had telesales reps. We would talk to every client. Uh, we called them customer service at the time. So you'd uh, we advertise. Client would come in. They want to hire a worker, and they'd say, "Hey, how does this service work?" And we'd say, "Well, this is how it works. You give us a credit card for we charge a hundred dollars." And then we're going to give you engineers. You're going to hire one. And then we're going to use that $100 as a down payment towards their work. And if you don't hire anybody, we'll refund your money back. And 70% of the time we spoke to a client, we got their credit card. So when you have a conversion rate that that's high, that is that high. So of the leads that came in, 70% of the time, they'd give us a credit card. So we had five customer service reps. And when I was at the company, I was chatting with customers. I said, hey, I'm going to spend the first month talking to customers and figure out. And every time I'd get a customer, I'd ring a little bell. I would annoy everybody because my conversion rate was higher than everybody else's. Right? So competitive I am. And I realized that you start doing the math on, well, if we want a million customers, how many of these reps are we going to need? Well, we're going to need a hundred of these reps to convert customers. But wait a second, if we're converting at 70%, why do we need the person in the middle? And so we went to what we called no touch, right? We, uh, we started by saying, okay, no phone calls, just chat. And then we said, well, what if we got rid of chat? How about all the questions that these customers are asking us? What if we automated that? And we made it so they could help themselves. And we turned the sale from a consultative or even a traditional sale into a transactional sale. We made it self-service. You come in and you don't really need to talk to a, a salesperson at this store to buy jeans. You can buy your own jeans. So what would you need in order to buy your own jeans? Well, you need a way to measure your way, see what was in fashion, read some tips about how you were going to use the, the dungarees, right? So that's what we did. We created a, a, a website and a service that was self-service as opposed to um, uh, speak to a human. And by going from low touch, you know, from high touch to low touch to no touch, 
you have to rip the Band-Aid off because if you don't, you'll always be walking with crutches, right? You got to get rid of the crutches and say, we got to walk. And that was a significant move in our go-to-market because we were able to get 3 million clients with no sales force, zero sales reps. And again, this is, you know, I used to have 200 sales reps at my previous responsibility. So this was really eye-opening for me. And um, I, I think the most valuable lesson learned from this story is that you really need to create a go-to-market or a, a, a way to get your product in the hands of customers uh, consistent with the way that they want to buy, right? And that was the uh, the valuable lesson. Fantastic. Gary, thanks so much for, for coming on the show today. For anyone that wants to find out more, say hello, get in touch, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I do most of my uh, writing on LinkedIn, and I think I'm uh, just G Gary Swart at LinkedIn. And so um, I think you can follow me there. I'm what's known as an influencer, and I tend to put something out every month or so. Uh, and, um, thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoy uh, your questions and I love talking about this stuff. So thank you very much. It's been fantastic having you on. Thanks so much for making the time. Have a great day. Cheers. Thanks for listening to episode 90 of the Startup Playbook podcast. Full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back next week with another episode, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.